Determinate Content Podcast, a philosophy podcast about articles and books in metaphysics, meta-metaphysics, meta-meta-metaphysics, meta-meta-meta-metaphysics, and meta-meta-meta-meta-metaphysics, but also adjacent areas. Hope you enjoy the content. If you do, be sure to smash that citation button. Hello and welcome everybody to this episode of Determinate Content. Today we have with us Benjamin Marshall, who is Junior Research Fellow at uh, Trinity College. And today we will be discussing um, Carnap and ontology, uh, quite broadly, but also in relation to uh, a forthcoming paper by Benjamin called Would Carnap Have Tolerated Modern Metaphysics, with, uh, uh, co-authored with uh, Wouter Cohen, and, and also in relation to his kind of other work on meta, metaphysics and stuff like that. Um, so I was wondering, before we, we start off, I was wondering if you'd like to introduce yourself in... in um, in more depth and also kind of explain why why you got into philosophy and why that might be worthwhile <laughs> if you'd like oh yeah <laughs> putting well, you on the spot here you. yeah <laughs> yeah the last part's difficult yeah, yeah firstly uh, thank you very much for uh, having me on this podcast i'm looking forward to talking about carnap and ontology and related matters um so yeah as a, i'm a junior research fellow which is like a a postdoctoral research position at the moment um, at Trinity College Cambridge. Previously, I did my PhD here at uh, Cambridge as well, uh, which was on Carnap and the ontology of mathematics um, in particular. Um, and I mean, when I arrived to do the PhD, I, I hadn't really like planned to work either on Carnap or mathematics. So it <laughs> somehow happened. But I had long since my undergraduate days had an interest in sort of the methodology of metaphysics, as it were, in particular ontology. Um, and I mean, this maybe came about that by the fact that first I went to some metaphysics seminars and found them very exciting. These debates about, oh, are there are there really tables hmm. or, or maybe just tiny particles, atoms and the like, but, but, but no tables in addition. Um, but I talking to people about this, I, I quickly became a bit worried about, um, you know, what, what these debates are, are really about, whether they're really facts to be discovered by metaphysicians. Uh, and, and if so, how these relate to sort of facts discovered by sciences like physics. Uh, so that's how I got into the whole thinking about the methods of metaphysics, um, as it were. Um, and I, well, approach that first by looking at contemporary debates in meta metaphysics, um, which I assume you'll have maybe heard about on this podcast as well from some of the protagonists like Thomas Hofweber, for instance. I, I I read his book on ontology and the ambitions of metaphysics when it was still in progress uh, back in the day. I also did some Kant, but then when I came to Cambridge, since the history of analytic philosophy is uh, is big around here, mm. I ended up with with Carnap, and I think I've benefited from that quite a lot. I mean, on the question of, um, you know, why why do philosophy in in the first place? I mean, um, that's, I guess, a, a tricky one. Um, I mean, I, I guess um, from the perspective of, of Carnap, the Vienna Circle and the, the logical positivists, um, maybe uh, th their thought was in a way that the kind of philosophy they do uh, would actually, in a very indirect way, be practically useful by uh, improving the methods of, um, of of science, which and in turn science is uh, useful because it helps us to you know c control the world somehow and shape it according to our ideas and improve it. And of course, that's a nice vision. Um, but I mean, as we will get into yeah. what I do in particular, we we might see that the gap actually between this ambition and the the groundwork is quite large but i think it's a good maybe vision to keep in mind yeah 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 we'll definitely get into that later but first i was i was wondering about your phd thesis so it was on carnap and uh philosophy of mathematics and i was wondering um could you describe uh, or how in your view how does his philosophy of mathematics relate more generally to his kind of views of, about ontology would you say and how they spring from from that view yeah that's a good question so i mean maybe um so a reason why uh i in a way liked working on the philosophy of mathematics and especially ontology uh is uh, i think from my perspective if you're interested in this very general question about the relation between you know language mm -hmm. and the world which is clearly really important for you know the possibility of metaphysics then mathematics seems like a good case study to think about like how does this work there right because you know one way to think about it is this 
sort of naive Platonist view where, well, we have uh, our mathematical language with numerals, two, three operations in it. And then we might think, well, there must be corresponding to that the mathematical reality somewhere in Platonic heaven, as it were. Um, but if you start like that, you immediately get into trouble of thinking, well, if that's the picture, then how is the connection made uh, to this abstract realm of numbers out there? Uh, so, I mean, partly for that reason, another extreme is this kind of formalist view associated with Hilbert that really is just the symbols we're manipulating, nothing that's being talked about by mathematics. Um, and I think what is in particularly quite interesting about Carnap is that he seems to, you know, try to have it both ways. So, so in a sense, he, in his philosophy of mathematics, the notion of analyticity plays a, a big role. So he wants all of mathematics to come out as analytic. And what that means is that somehow the mathematical statements follow from some linguistic rules of what he calls frameworks, which I assume we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. Whereas the empirical discourse statements about tables, chairs, particles, those are synthetic. So independent of the rules in a certain sense. Uh, so that sounds like formalism in a way, right? We have sort of linguistic rules and then everything flows from them. Uh, but he also sometimes sounds like a realist as well, uh, numerals and, and things refer to numbers which are mind independent objects, not linguistic in themselves. Um, and so so one, one might be a bit worried, well, how how can one how can one have it all or like talk like a realist in in, in one mode, but also seem to have this more formalist inspired um, approach based on analyticity. Um, and I think that's relates to Carnap's position in general, right? At some points he talks like this sort of relativist and conventionalist about ontology in general. It's just all um, comes down to certain stipulations we just can pragmatically adopt. Um, but at other times he he also talks kind of more like more like a realist in a sense. And so I mean, between these traditional categories like instrumentalism, conventionalism, and realism, I think Carnap is quite quite hard to place in a way. Hmm. Right. So yeah. Um but I but I suppose, yeah, we could get into frameworks there. So mm -hmm. um I mean, am I right of think to thinking um, from interpreting uh, what you, what you've written that um, he rejects a, a kind of crude conventionalism of the form that, for example, mathematical uh, statements are true in virtue of of the uh, rules of the language we were using, a uh, sort of metaphysical notion of analyticity, mm. but instead goes for something a, a more normative approach to understanding uh, frameworks. But could you say something about that? Yeah, good. So I think in a way, uh, Carl is often described as a conventionalist about uh, mathematics. And I think, I mean, it's not completely wrong to mm -hmm. think of him like that. But I mean, care is needed because there are many versions of conventionalism which seem kind of obviously implausible. And I think Carnap isn't one of those. Um, and I mean, if we look at the idea that somehow the truth of, say, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is somehow in virtue of linguistic conventions, mm -hmm. I mean, one immediate objection you might have is that, well, but it seems kind of um, necessary that two plus two equals four. It, it's not like that we made that the case. Mm. So it's not so clear what that would mean. Uh, but it seems, well, that certain linguistic conventions are accepted or, or something like that. I mean, that seems to be a sort of contingent um, matter of fact, right? It seems that that could be otherwise. I mean, if you look at you know, speaking mm. English, for instance, I mean, clearly English somehow as a language is based on certain conventions. Uh, and I mean, those could, could have been otherwise, it's right, like table might have been used in such a way that it refers to books rather than mm. tables. Uh, so it seems there's a mismatch between the sort of, it seems necessity, maybe also a priority independence of experience, the contingent effects of mathematics and conventions. So, and one might think, well, this shows that there's something wrong with, um, with this idea of the truth and virtue of, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that works well against some versions of conventionalism. Um, but I think that's not the way to think about uh, Carnap's in a way. So mm -hmm. I think if one were to put it in sort of contemporary um, terminology, maybe one way to think about what his frameworks and their linguistic rules do is more. 
um, they if they're set up in the way Carnap has in mind, they make it so that you know two plus two equals four um, expresses some proposition that is guaranteed to be true, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's it's not like the the sort of conventions are, and also the truth maker for that proposition. Right. As well. So it's not that we get this sort of problematic contingency uh, yeah. in in a way we don't want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's interesting because one one of the things that uh, led me to uh, to look into more of your work was was an art, uh, article you wrote on Amy Thomason, and um, I thought one thing there was quite interesting when you talked about various kind of idealist views about Muriology and uh, one due to Kenneth Pierce, which says that uh, sort of Muriological sums exist in virtue of the fact that we can sort of hold them together in thought or something like that. And I was curious, I thought this was interesting because you said in that article that using like a possible world, world's framework for determining uh, kind of the independence of a certain of certain a certain set of facts is not very good because I mean if you're a, a conventionalist or or maybe an idealist you think that certain facts hold in virtue of our conceptual frameworks or something then when you as, when you assess possible worlds you will use these conventions such that I mean even though it's it's in some sense true that or I mean yeah I'm just trying to figure out like what the position would even be because it doesn't seem like a conventionalist should they agree to this modal claim that that two plus two is equal to four would not have been true unless there were uh, the you know unless we we had the um, a, a particular set of com linguistic conventions in place? Like, should they even agree to that from the start? Um, I guess my question. Yeah, good. So um, yeah, I think you're right. It's sort of. Um much hangs on uh, how we think about certain sort of counterfactual conditionals, mm. right? Like if we had not adopted such and such conventions, um, what would have been true? Um, and I mean, um, maybe sticking to the example of numbers, I mean, mm. maybe one helpful way to think about it is, uh, so, I mean, one sort of plausible thought is in a way to say, well, you know, we couldn't really talk about numbers if we hadn't, wouldn't have a certain, uh, you know, linguistic um, resources, right? Yeah. The numerals, the addition sign maybe, or something like that. Uh, so it seems in a way, maybe unlike um, physical objects, right, which we sort of would just stumble into mm -hmm. without language as well. It seems numbers maybe aren't like that. I mean, you know, one can mm -hmm. maybe argue about the integers, maybe you can... You know, see a pair and in some sense have some perception related to two or so but I mean, certainly with more complex abstract objects um, it seems kind of like talking about them um, or sort of you know, referring to them is mm. not possible without certain linguistic resources mm. so there's some language dependence there uh, and I think that's in a way um, you also have that with propositions, for instance, and other sort of things which aren't linguistic as such, but they're a close relation to language. Uh, so, so that's kind of plausible. So there's some kind of language dependence there. But now the question is, um, does that somehow mean that uh, the linguistic resources we need to talk about these things make it so that mm. they exist, right? And I mean, you might say yes, and then you, I think, have this quite radical form of sort of conventionalism. Um, and I think this is uh, in the case of um, Mariology, maybe the sort of more I idealist view, openly idealist view, right? Where thought is that thinking about things as a composite really makes it the case that the composite um, exists. Um, but I think the more plausible position in many cases is more this view where you say, well, no, the linguistic rules uh, are really important to talk about the things mm. so do it without them. Um, but that doesn't mean that they make it the case that those things exist. And then, so if you think about counterfactuals, then would numbers still exist if, you know, we hadn't had mathematical language? Uh, you might well say, so yeah, sure. I mean, in such a possible world, if you want to think of it like that, the people in the world wouldn't be able to talk about the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can describe it in such a way that the numbers are sort of still there using our conceptual tools, even though... I mean, we would not be able to talk about the numbers if we hadn't those those tools. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but I but I was wondering uh, that if you don't accept that um, 
that kind of constitution claim or grounding claim mm-hmm. or something like what uh if if i indeed believe that numbers exist and um i'm a carnapian what would distinguish me from a platonist then who believes yeah. that numbers exist? But, but because surely a, a platonist would also agree that we couldn't talk about numbers unless we had a you know a, a correct language for doing so yeah but there's yeah so i'm just wondering like what what do what does the what do frameworks do in in kind of setting Karnap apart from big r realists or yeah <laughs> yeah very good right yeah because now as i presented it uh, Karnap comes across as a pretty much a realist platonist yeah. right and it seems well uh i think there's some truth to that but i mean it's still not quite the same so uh I think this is something that has puzzled many um, interpreters, right? Because the sort of his really influential um, article, Empiricism, Semantics and Ontology, explicitly starts by saying, oh, people have been really, especially empiricists um, at the time, have been really worried about talking about numbers and had this preference for nominalism. But I can't, what I want to do is basically tell you that it's fine to quantify over numbers. No reason to feel guilty about that. Uh, and that, in a way, seems like, in some sense, a defense of Platonism. So um, mm. I think um, much depends, in a way, on what you mean by Platonism, yeah. though, right? So I think, I mean, one way, I mean, if you think about the climate, the sort of Kana was writing, so Quine had already started to mm. uh, publish on ontology, right, and put forward this criterion of ontological commitment, according to which, you know, the things... Uh, you you quantify as range over those are that exist according to the theory we're dealing with, uh, and so based on that you might have this sort of purely quantificational criterion of Platonism, right? To think you're a Platonist if you quantify over abstract objects like numbers, um, and it seems well if we think that's Platonism, then it's maybe not so inaccurate to say that in some sense Carnap recommends a form of mm. Platonism or at least says it's I mean, if you want to quantify over numbers, um, feel free to do so. Um, so so in a sense, and since you mentioned sort of the normative strains in Carnap's philosophy, mm-hmm. it's maybe at this point important to point out that often, you know, he puts forward frameworks as a sort of recommendation, right? Saying, well, you know, this framework seems useful to me. So if you find it useful too, go ahead and use it. But it's not, the claim is not that somehow you have to use it or it's the correct one. Um, right yeah um but one might think well okay maybe platonism um in mathematics um involves a bit more than just saying you can quantify over numbers right um so for instance um i mean one one way to think about it i started earlier to sketch this picture of you know there's mathematical language here and there's the the realm of uh, platonic objects there, or maybe it should be up here. <laughs> and now the question is, how is the connection made, as it were, right? So, I mean, Carnap never seems to be worried about this kind of thing, right? Like, how is the connection between numerals and numbers made? He thinks this is quite unproblematic. Whereas many people who have written about mathematical Platonism have thought, no, that's actually quite mysterious how that could come about. Um, and I think the difference there is that Kana basically has this quite deflationary conception of reference, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. it's quotational. So two, the numeral in quotation marks refers to two. For him, it's just another sort of rule he puts into his frameworks, and that's all there is. Um, and so from some perspective, one might think, well, this conception of reference is quite thin and deflationary. Maybe real Platonism requires something more. Uh, and so I think in that sense, that would be one distinguishing criterion between Carnap's internal Platonism, as I have yeah. at some point called it, and sort of more big R types of realism. Yeah, and I guess would would another perhaps source of the difference between between um, a sort of a a, pl- a big R Platonist, big R realist Platonist, and a, an internal uh, Platonist, something like that. Uh, could that come also down to this normativity we might get into more? Like, um, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, one feature of Carnap's uh, system that you write about is the principle of tol- tolerance, um, which says that there's no kind of mandate to use any linguistic framework over any other. There's no, there's only a practical concern, what, what serves our purposes better. And this might, would this potentially go against a more 
realist sort of Platonist who views it as um, as an objective matter, perhaps that um, a a mathematical framework is is more suitable than a um, a sort of a, a framework about witches or or you know some non-existent uh, set of entities. Yeah, definitely. I think the principle of tolerance is kind of really important for understanding kind of sort of meta philosophy here. Um, so, I mean, the principle of tolerance, I think, is quite a sort of revolutionary idea kind of had in the 1930s. So there was a time when there was a lot of uh, disagreement in the foundations of uh, logic and mathematics uh, about, for instance, is it OK to use classical logic with the principle of bivalence or should we become intuitionists or something like that? Um, and, um, well, at some point, Carnap um, came to the conclusion that, in a way, you can do, in some sense, what you want. So he thought that the idea that certain logics need to be kind of justified as correct, uh, that was basically a way mistaken. Um, and so then he put mm -hmm. forward this principle of tolerance, which says, in logic, there are no morals. Um, everyone is at liberty to um, basically construct and use their own logic if they if they want to um and then in deciding whether to use one we care about like well is it useful for what you want to do these kind of pragmatic considerations um but it's not like that there's some objectively correct matters of fact about um which logic is true and this and logic is construed broadly here so basically extends to mathematical theories and, and, and anyway, frameworks in general Mm -hmm. uh, and you're right to think that that, in a way, um, makes what Carnap does uh, sometimes less objective than some more sort of big R realists would have it. And maybe like one example to illustrate that. So if you think about um, set theory, so the, the standard uh, way to do set theory nowadays is use something like Zemilo Frankel set theory and, and maybe plus the various sort of um, axioms about the existence of some, some very large, large sets. Um, and, and that's the dominant paradigm. Uh, but there are other systems of set theory, um, which are so just a bit different. Um, for instance, Quine came up with one called New Foundations, mm -hmm. um, which I mean wasn't so popular. Like it's more studied as a curiosity mm -hmm. uh, now. Um, but it's kind of interestingly different from ZFC, the dominant one, for instance, whether sets can be members of themselves. So in ZFC, the answer is always uh, no. But in points new foundations, there can be sets that are members of themselves. So mm. it seems there's a different conception of sets here. Uh, and now, so let's think about how do we decide between those. So if one thinks about it purely pragmatically, it probably makes more sense to learn the dominant one, ZFC, right? If you want to talk to other set theorists. And I think everyone can agree with that. I mean, even Quine, even though he, of course, liked his own system a bit, um, in the end, I guess, kind of came to the view that it doesn't make sense to just fight against the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but one might think, well, so the fact that the one has become dominant, does that show us that the sets are really like ZFC describes them? And Quine was somehow wrong in um, trying to represent the nature of sets. And I think some forms of mathematical realism basically think of it like that, right? There's just the one set theoretic universe out there mm. and our theories tr are trying to capture what does it look like? And that would be the kind of view Carnap's principle of tolerance excludes, right? He would say, well, no, pragmatically, of course, we might agree the ZFC is in some sense superior, but it's not that this is tracking kind of objective facts about what set theoretic reality is like. So mm -hmm. I think that's quite a subtle difference in a way. And I think not people are maybe often not so clear about the difference between pragmatic yeah. to accept this and sort of these more metaphysical ones. But I think that would be a clear, clear difference in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I was, because you mentioned Quine before and I was interested there because, I mean, there's this, I mean, quite a lot in the literature it's mentioned that sort of Quine bought, brought uh, metaphysics back and then there's been a, a backlash against this saying that um that he he only brought metaphysics back in some kind of deflationary form not in the form that uh, that modern proponents of metaphysics uh, urge uh, and there's also a kind of form of literature saying that uh, the view the the view that quine 
overcame Carnap or that he kind of defeated Carnap through his critique of of, um, of um, the analytic synthetic distinction and so on, um, that he didn't actually, you know, it, it, he didn't resurrect metaphysics uh, with it. And I was I was wondering in relation to to what you said there about because it seems that a, a common um, methodology that metaphysicians use is is that is using pragmatic to a certain extent criteria for choosing a theory. So so they look at maybe not popularity or like the you know the extent to which a certain say set theoretic uh, uh, framework is used, but they look at uh, its kind of elegance and simplicity and explanatory power and so on. And then they claim that from this we can infer that it correctly describes this maybe set theoretic reality that you scri- that you describe here. But I mean, it's it's very important to distinguish this from Carnap's view about how we should use pragmatic criteria such as elegance, simplicity, explanatory strength, and so on for assessing ontological frameworks. So, could you say something about, or or do you think that's true? And uh, and you know, how does Quine and Carnap uh, differ? Uh, would you say? Yeah, very good. I yeah. love talking about how Carnap and yeah. Quine differ because that's sort of my new project. <laughs> okay. I'm, yeah. Uh, working on uh, now um and i mean uh, you know to the conclusion i would like to defend which i think is true and i hope i can you know convince people is that sort of actually the if you compare khan up especially with the sort of mature coin let's mm. say so after after word and object 1960 and then some developments in to in in in, in the the decades after um I think the differences are actually quite small. So mm-hmm. I would certainly side with those who kind of say, well, the story that Quine brought metaphysics back, I mean, that's definitely a, a mistake in a, in a sense, at least, I mm-hmm. mean, if by metaphysics, um, we mean things like those done by Ted Sider, for instance, mm-hmm. who d- describes his methodology as neo Quinean. Um, yeah, but I would say, no, that's like a, a very, very major, major gap here. So, so they're kind of inquiring, uh, if you contrast it with this approach, uh, really pretty much indistinguishable. Um, so, so that's a big difference. And it has, I think, um, I mean, there are much could be said about this and, um, um, but since, since you mentioned this, uh, idea that sort of pragmatic comparisons can tell us about reality. Um, I think that's actually one way uh, to, to see that there's quite a quite a difference here, right? So um, as I, I mean, described sort of with Carnap, it's basically saying that, well, some theories might be pragmatically better than others, but this does not tell us anything about the real structure of reality because he didn't mm-hmm. believe mm-hmm. such a thing, right? So you basically stick to the pragmatic level. Um, I think and that contrasts quite clearly with sort of contemporary metaphysicians who often use this sort of inference to best explanation yeah, yeah. from the, the pragmatic goodness of a theory to, oh, so the reality itself must be as the theory says it is, right? So I think um, that's really, um, in a way, comes down to a rejection of the principle of tolerance saying, mm. well, in some sense, there is some objectively distinguished theory namely that that matches some joints in nature and these pragmatic virtues are sort of our epistemic guide to what that structure would be uh, like mm-hmm. um and i mean in light of that now the question is how does quine fit in and there's certainly a sort of narrative that suggests that he's more on the side of these inference for his best explanation using metaphysicians right because he's often um seen as having put forward this sort of indispensability argument for numbers for instance right so we need to believe that numbers exist because we couldn't do physics without them uh and of course in a way that's kind of kind of true that he says that right so he 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 liked nominalism back in the day but came to conclude that uh it sort of doesn't work um but i mean i think that the difficulty is then should we read that as making this sort of inference towards what the ultimate structure of reality is like. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think for Quine, there's good evidence showing that, no, that's not how he thought about it. I mean, for him, in a way, um, he does not have a distinction between pragmatic and sort of epistemic considerations in the way Carnap has. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so that also maybe um, tells against my story, 
Uh, but nevertheless, one can give some clear indications of thinking why he, he wouldn't have believed in sort of this, these joints in nature we could get at, um, namely his views on sort of um, empirically equivalent theories. Mm. Um, so he always thought that it might be that we find a theory which is sort of empirically equivalent to our own physics and what have you. So in a way, just as good, but sort of ontologically quite different, Ryan talks about different sort of things. Um, and this kind of situation, it seems, um, would be a bit of a problem for the kind of metaphysician who wants to draw conclusions about the nature of reality, right? Because we have two theories, then it seems, well, yeah. the nature of reality is either like this or like that has it, so which is it? Um, but what Quine said about that is completely different. He changed his mind a bit, but he certainly at times toyed with the view that we should just say, oh, both are true, right? So it's just mm. two so in in some sense equivalent, but in others inequivalent ways of describing reality, uh, and I think that actually is way closer to to the Carnapian view in a way, right? That if you have two useful frameworks, you know, just use whichever yeah. is best, and there's no sort of additional correctness beyond correctness in the theory. Mm. So it's a long answer, but it's also a long and complicated. Yeah, story. yeah, no, no, I completely get that. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, another question with regards to that. So there seems to be, I mean, quite literally a lot of kind of hand waving going on with <laughs> like, you know, language on the one hand and world on the other yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah. And I know there are, there are certain interpretations of Carnap where he has an expressivist um, interpretation of sentences like, you know, is ultimately true or is really true or something like that. Yeah. And I was wondering if, I mean, if you have that sort of view, then couldn't you just say, as you mentioned before, with regards to kind of Platonism, that just because you're a deflationist about reference and so on, like you can say that number terms refer to numbers. And just because we're deflationist or expressivist about, you know, really existing out there in the eternal world or something like that, we can affirm such statements. Um, because, because I mean, if you're... If you're um, um, because if you if you adopt a certain theory, then um, uh, on the basis of these uh, constraints or these um, 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 these uh, these different virtues, then you might say that mm -hmm. when we come out of that inquiry and we say, well, it's been established now that numbers really exist out there. It's just an expression of of yeah. my attitude after I have I have um, gone through with this inquiry. And would that, I mean, if if that if you have that view with that sort of um, collapse uh, Carnap's view with potentially a sort of metaphysical, you know, metaphysical realist view about yeah. what we're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, I mean, I like the suggestion, right? Mm. If I understood that correctly, um, I think that's a very good idea to kind of say, well, if, and I mean, as I said, some mm. sometimes Carnap sounds quite metaphysical, right? Yeah. Like passage, yeah. Where he just sort of asserts, yeah, by the way, propositions are uh, mind-independent uh, entities yeah. and concepts are abstract entities. So, I mean, that sounds like it's taken from a, a contemporary metaphysics paper. And mm. in order to make sense of what's going on there, I think the strategy I would use is sort of what you suggest them to say, well, it's basically can be viewed as an abbreviation of this kind of claim saying, well, I, I recommend to yeah. you so that's sort of expressive component right to to use a framework with rules mm. such that in that framework it comes out as true that the propositions are mind independent or whatever you want to um make so yeah. um if i understand that correctly um i agree that's i think a helpful um, a way to think about it and like flocker and Krauter yeah yeah exactly yeah depend on that in more, more detail right i think that's helpful then the question is well if you do that though can we still distinguish Khan up from metaphysical realists. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's a tricky one. I mean, since I'm more on the Khan up side, I mean, mm. I would always be happy to say, well, no, isn't this all we need? Like, yeah. What more could you want in yeah. Yeah. spelling out really? But I feel probably metaphysicians, not everyone would be happy with thinking that this is all we do, right? So yeah, but, yeah it's tricky to adjudicate. Yeah, right. I guess we can we can leave that there and go more into this uh, to this paper about um, modern metaphysics in Carnap, uh, because one one um, uh, the sort of the central claim there is that 
that um, these debates around uh, various different frameworks for talking about objects or numbers and so on about as to whether um, there really are um, composite objects or whether there really are numbers and so on should is massively like it's just a, like a massive waste of time uh, and that we should not like there's a usual kind of interpretation of Carnap which says that these debates are meaningless uh, but that can be interpreted in two ways so it might either be like you know it lacks semantic content or it might be that it's it's kind of a useless practical endeavor um and yeah i was wondering if you'd like to kind of uh, yeah say something more about that um how carnap's philosophy might might lead to kind of a, a practical recommendation to stop yeah. doing to stop <laughs> doing metaphysics of that sort yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe like some brief remark the this paper in general. Um, so this is uh, co-authored with uh, mm. my friend and colleague Walter Cohen, also here at Cambridge. And uh, I mean, one idea was that Carnap has this um, paper still from the uh, his, his very early period um, mm. before in the late 1920s, early 30s, before tolerance, which is very well known though the it's often translated as the elimination of metaphysics through logical um, analysis of language, maybe overcoming metaphysics is a mm. bit better, but so it's obviously an anti-metaphysical paper. Uh, and so, I mean, it's uh, for that reason, it's also written in a lively polemical style. Mm. So mm. I read this in undergrad very early on. So this is, I think, the first impression of Carnap's views on metaphysics that many people will get. Um, but what he targets there is people like Heidegger, right? Which mm. you know does some kind of metaphysics, but it seems very different in pretty much every way from contemporary metaphysics, right? Heidegger just didn't like formal logic, for instance, mm. uh, whereas contemporary metaphysics usually you use logic and formal tools to express their views. Uh, and so one thought one might have is that well, maybe this critique of metaphysics you early Carnap had was good for the metaphysicians of his time. Um, but maybe kind of would have been kind of fine with what's called metaphysics nowadays, um, especially after the principle of tolerance, because it seems, well, you know, if there's no, uh, if there are no morals in logic, then, mm. I mean, you know, what's, you know, what's wrong with uh, building metaphysical theories, right? It seems in a way the principle of tolerance seems to recommend um, exploring lots of theoretical avenues. Um, so one mm. might have thought that actually, the mature Carnap uh, would be really on board with um, contemporary analytic metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, some people have suggested that this no. is kind of the, the right uh, reading, but Wouter and I thought, well, that can't be right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> clearly, clearly Carnap would have um, I mean, disliked at least some aspects of contemporary metaphysics. I mean, you need to look at it on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. but uh, it seems wrong. And then we thought about, well, okay, but what would this sort of, Canapian argument against contemporary metaphysics B, and in order to, I mean, to give this some content, um, we, we we chose one sort of debate yeah. on ontology, right, having to do with uh, Mariology, basically mm -hmm. the uh, question of uh, you know whether there are any composite objects at all, or maybe only simples, or and if so, what which principles of compositions are the correct ones, things like that. Um, and what might complain, it's maybe an easy target, right? Many people mm. have complained that this debate seems maybe not as substantial <laughs> as it's, some of its practitioners make it out to be. Mm. But I mean, fair enough. So one, one needs to have something on the table, as it were. Um, and so, I mean, our diagnosis can then maybe be summed up as follows. So uh, there is a certain... Um, trend in analytic um, metaphysics, uh, which basically is to try to do something without assuming certain objects. Yeah. Right. So it's a sort of anxiety about ontological posits. So the, the, in terms of how the debate about Mariology works. So in some sense, everyone agrees like, well, it's pretty useful to talk about uh, tables and other composite, right? So it's certainly, there needs to be some way to, uh, make sense of a claim like there are three books on the table yeah um, and then one option is just to take tables and books as objects in your ontology and be fine with that uh, but then other people try to come up with paraphrases using through logic or mm. tools like 
that to to do the same thing as the people who believe in the tables, but without having the tables. Uh, and the thought seems to be, well, it's somehow better to have fewer things in, mm. in some sense. Um, and we think at that point, Kana would have said, well, wait a minute. I mean, how exactly is it better? Uh, because it seems if the, you know, the, 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 the sort of mode of speech, as it were, that just uh, takes uh, tables and books um, at face value, as it were, and accept in gerontology is useful and has been around already. Mm. Uh, what's the value of coming up with this replacement theory that sort of does the same thing, just in a more complicated way? Uh, and so there might be reasons to be interested in it, but just avoiding ontology, we think from this Canapian tolerance standpoint, uh, is, is not a good reason. So that's maybe our criticism in a nutshell. So if the only thing that motivates you is to avoid ontological commitment, we think Kana would, would have said like, well, that doesn't seem like a well-motivated project really just, um, just accept the objects and be happy with that. And mm. like, we'd be tempted to think that he was probably right, but maybe just for now, that's the, the shape of the argument. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I was wondering with, in relation to that, regarding what you said earlier about um, about this kind of this hand wavy picture of language here in the world mm. over here. Uh, I mean, isn't isn't one kind of nice feature about Carnap system is that it would seemingly avoid ontological commitment to a world out there in the in the hand wavy sense, but maybe not in a in a kind of deflationary yeah. sense. Um, so, so could you, yeah, could you say, I mean, maybe that points again to the, to the need of, f the need of distinguishing, you know, internal yeah. ontological commitment and some kind of external ontological commitment. Um, yeah, 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 good. So that, yeah, that's one of the things that makes debating this, uh, often so confusing at yeah. some point, right? Because it seems, well, you know, inside the framework, you, you have this ontology, but then there's this sort of outside perspective <laughs> um, yeah. where it seems you sort of um, choose between the different frameworks, but there's no sort of outside um, ontology. Mm. And I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, one thing from the Canapian perspective, one would definitely say, I mean, if you, um, if you, think about yourself being in this outside perspective and then you compare two frameworks they do sort of both do kind of the same job mm. uh and then you 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 want to choose in some way right probably if, because it seems like if you have two tools for the same job it's maybe better to focus one's attention and resources to just the one and develop that further and of course there are various considerations here but i think from this outside perspective um the fact that the one you know relies on fewer objects mm. i think would usually not be such a um such a relevant consideration mm. right because i mean it, it's not like um and this is maybe the more realist view maybe ha could have the concern that well uh maybe the one which uses more objects is less likely to be true yeah. because the objects might not exist or something like that. Mm. Um, but I think that that is maybe something which, from this Carnapian perspective, where there's no true ontology yeah. just independently of all the frameworks, right? You couldn't have this anxiety about the objects failing to be there, right? Because in way, the only notion of ontology you have is always internal to the framework. So that's maybe one way to think about this. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably. The, yeah, the, the the motivation behind avoiding ontological commitment, but I guess it shall be said that uh, many, um, I mean, nihilists do not just endorse the claim that there are only or that there are particles. They also endorse the claim that there are only particles. So I guess you know, if the mm -hmm. world happens to contain tables, then they would be uh, they would be wrong as well. And that that would also be a source of anxiety, I guess. Um, but. <laughs> um, you claim that um, uh, it's it's kind of useless to to discuss these these questions of ontological um, uh, parsimony or like you know committing to as few objects as possible. Uh, and you argue that, or you sort of hold that there are other considerations that should come into play, practical considerations, and that mm -hmm. not a whole lot of current metaphysical debates hinge on 
considerations that are of massive practical value. Uh -huh. um, so, so that's why we should kind of go away from that and use uh, use our uh, mental resources for for something else <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, 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 what should we do instead? Do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good question, right? Because mm. one might say, well, yeah, it's uh, it seems maybe we're right that Mariology is not the best use of people's brain power, but then it's uh, criticizing people for having the wrong, <laughs> according to to us and kind of wrong metaphysical uh, views so much better. Mm. Well, yeah, the f fair point. Um, so it, it might be better to like get away from the sort of very very highly abstract meta level uh and do more practical things and i mean so i feel i'm maybe not so well qualified to do those given my training unfortunately mm -hmm. uh, yeah but it seems i mean it's like if i could do it all again uh certainly um one thing i think i have now taken from uh thinking about kana also quine and these um these uh, very abstract theoretical matters is that um, I think many uh, philosophic questions, if they're really sort of interesting and hard, at some point will boil down to sort of normative considerations. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, think, I think the sort of the, the 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 connection to practical things usually takes the shape of some kind of uh, 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 normative problem. And I mean, maybe one to put this in the slogan. I mean, one sort of move the Canapians usually always make right in a in a broad brush form would be to say, well, you know, theoretical philosophers often seem to fight about, you know, which of two descriptions to mm. apply to reality. And one, if one is really of Carnap at least, is tempted to feel that, well, what's so wrong with just saying both are correct, right? Mm. So it's often seems am I completely fine, you know, to describe reality in this way which has composites uh, maybe it's also possible to do so with only particles but do mm. we really need this decision of which is objectively correct it seems people could just get along and everyone uses their uh, favorite language yeah uh, i think this sort of deflationary move you know just give you similar to the sets i talked about earlier right one could have this view that there are sets in the set of c sense and there are sets in coin sense uh, and we can say that both exist and if you want to talk about them that's fine so one can always de deflate these various disagreements by being like very conciliatory. Um, but that's theoretical philosophy, right? Which purports to be descriptive, but with normative questions mm. where at some point there the question is, um, what should I do? I mean, there you can't always just say, well, do in the one sense this and do the other <laughs> that, right? There some decision is actually needed. So, so that's uh, something I have found now by thinking about things which seem not normative at all, right? Like the mathematics. So, I mean, maybe, um, <laughs> I mean, if I could do it all again, I think I would focus on normative parts of philosophy, yeah. I think, early on, it seems to me. Yeah, no, I, I guess I guess my question was also kind of directed towards, because, I mean, my myriology might be an example of, of a sort of issue that seems practically useless because mm -hmm. i mean because it is i mean it's like it just has a theoretical um it just has a theoretical goal um but i mean certain other issues in in metaphysics and philosophy more generally are are sort of often often introduce some kind of anxiety because you think that it has practical implications like you know the the problem of free will for example is often taken to to have massive um implications but also problems about you know what is it to be a person uh yeah. and and so so what i what i meant by this you know what should we ask instead what questions should we be asking instead it's rather like you know how should we conduct inquiry into these yeah. into those questions which are which do have like immense practical importance if we're if we if we're not uh, if we, we cannot use these tools developed by contemporary metaphysicians um but that's yeah, perhaps um, a very tough uh, tough question but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's difficult yeah. but i mean it seems to me i mean i think many of the tools in a way and even the theories are probably mm. often like quite all right i think what sometimes um it seems to me might hinder progress is a certain sort of self-image of what one is doing right so mm. the basically this realist picture with big r where there are sort of uh, joints in nature and we're trying to track them because i mean that brings with it this 
idea that there is sort of usually one correct answer and also find the answer is this purely descriptive enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's like appropriate for something like physics, maybe. But I'm sort of, especially with things that have some normative implications, like, right, the concept of a person free will. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would be sympathetic to views which say, well, what's called metaphysics there maybe in some sense concerns more our concepts of these things right like a person mm. and agency um and it's maybe not a good um sort of self-image to see yourself as tracking i don't know natural kinds out there i mean certainly from the canapian perspective i would be much more sympathetic to people who frame these debates in terms of like what concepts do we use in scenarios as mm. what, what, think of as a person or as an agent and then also the normative question well might be that we use concept in this way but should we maybe use them in other ways so i mean one trend in recent philosophy is this sort of uh, conceptual engineering approach yeah. right it's also straight back to Carnap, and it seems to me they're certainly right about uh something there namely that um this is a very canapian idea that we're not sort of bound to joints in nature out there but you know where we can shape uh concepts in a certain sense and it's a good idea for philosophers um, to do so i mean disappointingly i don't have any concepts to like mm. recommend to you now mm -hmm. which is more exciting Sadly. area yeah. um, because i think in philosophy of mathematics and these really um foundational eras of, of language and how it relates to the world i think there's maybe less direct normativity going on there um, and i think it's somehow interesting and something valuable to think about for sure um, yeah. but the, the practical use is slender i admit yeah yeah so i was i was wondering about another thing so in the in the paper you talk about neo carnapians just as a, there are neo quinians or neo carnapians and and one of them is uh, amy thomason who has uh, quite similar views but you are you hold that it's not completely what carnap would have said about about ontology, her, her view. So I was wondering if you'd like to expound on that. Yeah, yeah, a bit. So, I mean, in a way with uh, Amy Thomason, I mean, I'm in broad agreement, I think with nearly all the sort of conclusion she draws mm. about um, contemporary metaphysics. So she's also uh, thinks that Mariology and things like that are probably not what yeah. one should like focus one's attention on. Uh, I'm just, the way these conclusions are arrived at sometimes seems to me, I mean, whether they they're right or wrong or work or plausible or not is maybe a separate question. I mean, I think there are objections that could be raised, but I mean, one claim she makes is that her way of arriving at these conclusions is very close to Carnap's. Um, and but I think there is a bit of a mismatch, it seems to me, because um, Thomason draws heavily on sort of basically natural language, how we use certain terms in english right for instance her arguments for saying that composite objects exist is heavily based on certain supposed conceptual truth about table for instance that somehow mm. if there are particles arranged table wise somehow this is said to entail that there is a table in virtue of certain rules of use for the word table in english and i mean that yeah it's an interesting view and it looks canapian firstly right because you might think ah yeah these rules are like Carnap's framework rules. And I mean, that's an analogy mm. Thomson also draws. But I mean, one needs to be careful, I think, because Carnap was very clear, the linguistic frameworks, they're not natural language itself. Mm. Uh, they're something different. And they're also, um, I think this has confused many people and it's important to stress, they're not meant to be descriptive semantics, right? They're not meant to capture rules in English. Um, mm. So he thought, well, in a way, it doesn't really matter so much how we use things in English because he thought natural language is that kind of a mess. Let's not try to sort that out by studying the rules we actually use. Well, let's, if you have some clear purpose for some concept, just come up with a framework that does this job really well and really clearly. And he calls those of explications of concepts, right? So replacements, more precise replacements of given concepts for certain purposes, uh, and then work with those. Uh, and so my worry about the Thomason position is um, that, I mean, her view is really open to various objections about uh, natural language um, mm. in a way that Carnap isn't. And so I think the Carnapian original might be stronger in a way. And what's a bit ironic about this, so 
of course, Quine is famous for not liking Carnap's use on analyticity. Mm. Um, and what seems to have happened there is basically this. So Quine thought that when Carnap said that there's a distinction about the analytic and synthetic, this was supposed to be a thesis about English, that somehow mm -hmm. in English that we have this sort of implicit distinction. Uh, and then Quine thought, well, that seemed kind of wrong. There's not really a sort of behavioral criterion or anything. Uh, and then Kant's reply was to say, yeah, I agree with that. But what I just wanted to do is to draw, this, draw the distinction within my frameworks. And so I recommend to people to use analytic and synthetic like I do, basically, is what I want to do. This does not entail that we actually do so. Um, and I think that's a, you know, a strong response to many of these Quinean concerns. Um, but Thomason doesn't go for that. She basically tries to defend uh, the existence of her conceptual truth for natural language. Hmm. Um, and well, I feel one should maybe stick to the original on that point. So that's that's the story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have I have one one last question. So I was so there seems to be a kind of move that is often made in the in the literature which is a kind of metaphysics first move or something by mm -hmm. sort of timothy williamson and michael devitt and and sort of related figures that metaphysics is not at all a semantic you know it doesn't presuppose any kind of semantic doctrine about a sort of language on the one hand and world on the here on the other hand and a kind of correspondence between them or something like that and an investigation into what the world is like independently of how we use language or, or i mean it does but it's not a language um it's not um um it's not a, it's not a project that is trying to use linguistic means to describe that that world but it's just it's just <laughs> just trying to describe it uh, and i was wondering if if couldn't i mean if you're if you're a a carnapian and you're i'm wondering you know should i adopt a framework that it requires me to talk about numbers uh, shouldn't I kind of use the sort of considerations that metaphysicians are using today in order to figure out whether I should adopt that framework? And would that perhaps not, would that, I mean, if you, if you can see that, would that not lead to contemporary metaphysics being like undermined? Because it, um, because, you know, someone might say, well, metaphysics is just, um, you know, it's not not some big fancy thing about discovering, you know, what the world is, you know, outside of uh, all possible experience of language. It's just, you know, we just want to know what knowledge is. We want to know what objects are. We want to know um, these questions. And it's not, and, and the sort of the way we investigate that might c completely coincide with with the way that these, the, that some, a Carnapian might choose a, a linguistic framework. Do you see what, do you see what I'm, what I'm kind of um, going for that? So, I mean, I'm, I think I'm not quite sure I got all of that, but I think one thing which, uh, so is it right? So are you suggesting that in a way, if we just, let's say, let's abstract from the methodologies and just, just compare which theories does the metaphysician Williamson say end up using and which theory does the Canadian <laughs> end up using? It might be that it's basically the same one, right? Is, was was that a thought that the result seems sort of the right, same? Right, and and that the, the, the procedure for justifying a certain yeah. uh, uh, adopting a certain framework might also coincide. And then someone might say, well, the metaphysician has to commit to a sort of a correspondence between the framework and reality. Yeah, yeah. But then these theorists would say, no, it doesn't. You know, no one commits to that, uh, or at least not the metaphysician. Uh, what we're trying to, we're just interested in whether there are numbers and. And all sorts of considerations might come into to play there, but you don't have to suppose this kind of correspondence relation, which perhaps yeah. Carnap would be critical of. Uh, and yeah. uh, do you think metaphysics could survive in that form after after Carnap? Uh, or? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm. Yeah. I think I'm. Uh, I think I'm starting to see. So I think I'm sympathetic to this idea that in a way. Um, I mean, this maybe has to do with like so what's really meant by a pragmatic comparison of frameworks, yeah. right? So uh, it it does seem kind of plausible that in many cases uh, what you will look at um, is similar to, if you're a Karna, basically, it's quite similar to what metaphysicians look at, right? So I mean, so I maybe so far like 
suggested that you know the canopian should always be in favor of objects right take all the objects mm. you can but even that is kind of not true yeah. right because especially like mathematical theories if you make some there's the danger of the inconsistency mm. and if you don't want that like that seems pragmatically uh sensible to not want to have inconsistent theories uh and also avoid the danger of inconsistency if things are not needed so in the, some sense um even from the pragmatic point of view, there are cases where uh, avoiding ontological equivalence yeah. is sensible. And one might worry that, well, maybe like if one looks at all the details, actually in many cases, it will turn out that uh, the the actual considerations are really similar. It's yeah. just that sort of the Canapians always add, oh, by the way, this is just pragmatics. And the realists yeah. always add like, oh, but now we can, after we've done all the hard work, also apply this inference to this explanation and say, oh, yeah. this is what joints in nature are. But it seems if that comes <laughs> at the last step when all the substantial theorizing has been done, um, yeah, that, yeah, that would be... In a way, this meta perspective doesn't make such a difference. And then if that's true, I mean, for whom is that bad, right? That's, yeah. That seems quite a difficult question. Yeah, and surely, surely about certain uh, certain objects, there should be there should be a kind of um, uh, a collapse between practical concerns and and just ontological yeah. commitment. I mean, uh, for example, like you know, why should I commit to to noises emanating from people's mouths? Might just yeah. I mean, the reasons that might be just you know because there are no. I mean, this is a noise that is emanating from yeah. someone's mouth yeah. and. And in you know in all of those areas, perhaps the the metaphysician and the the Carnapian would would agree. Although the metaphysician might say that there are just um, particles emanating from yeah, particles yeah, yeah, yeah. arranged mouthwise, uh, but not yeah any composite yeah. No, there's certainly that's would be, there are some cases where it actually seems we contrive to go with the Carnapian pragmatic rule, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, suppose I. Um, I, I I dislike certain things, let's mm. say licorice, right? I mean, if I then adopt a framework in which I can't talk about it, um, I mean, that seems like uh, I'm really just ignoring things that really exist in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so yeah, it's uh, if, if you if you if, if you look at really sort of observable phenomena, um, it, it does seem that there is a sense in which there is some sort of world which has a certain structure which um if we have a framework which just ignores them it's really mm. missing out on reality in in some sense mm. uh and i mean that's actually a quite interesting question and not much i think has been written about this from the canapian perspective mm. um but i think i mean if there remains a sense in which the frameworks need to sort of be appropriate to some extra linguistic reality and i think there probably is i think one can spell this out in a way that is much less sort of heavy duty realist than mm. what many metaphysicians want to write so i mean in particular i don't think that you need to think that the world in itself consists of like objects mm -hmm. right i think the division of things into particular objects that will probably come from the frameworks and i think this is in a way what makes quine's word an object and what, what came afterwards so so interesting that yeah. he way wants to stick with this idea that yeah obviously we are sort of responding to reality but mm -hmm. the notion of like objects and distinction into predicates names etc that all is, is not taken as basic right so that comes later in development so i think that's the thing Karnap didn't really work on but which uh, i think is important so that's why why one needs crime yeah hmm okay i think we've we've passed the, the one hour mark so we should probably quit this very interesting discussion but yes. thank you so much for uh, for joining us today uh, yes it was a pleasure thank you very much thank you